Hello, my name is Brett Peterson. I work at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where I'm a member of the ERCP practice group. On behalf of the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, I'm happy to introduce another topic in our series of short, clinically useful video tips, analogous to those dealing with general endoscopy, colonoscopy, Barrett's esophagus, and practice management. This series will focus on performance of ERCP, including basic or complex considerations pertinent to clinical decision making, device selection, and many common but challenging techniques and maneuvers. Hopefully many will provide tricks of the trade that will prove useful when specific challenges arise in your practice. We welcome your input as the series progresses in coming months. To start this series, we want to grasp the opportunity to address a major and growing concern in the practice of ERCP that of transmission of infection by contaminated duodenoscopes and, in particular, transmission of carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae, or CRE, infections. The transmission of carbapenem-resistant organisms by duodenoscopes used for ERCP gained modest public attention following 2014 publications in MMWR, JAMA, and other medical journals regarding outbreaks in Illinois and Pittsburgh. Recently, the disclosure of additional outbreaks in Seattle and Los Angeles has generated intense coverage in the lay media, thrusting this issue into broad public awareness and generating great concern. Enterobacteriaceae are the natural bacterial inhabitants of the gastrointestinal tract. They include Klebsiella species, E. coli, Enterobacter, and others. Carbapenem-resistant organisms develop when natural bacteria acquire one of several known plasmid-borne resistance factors from other Enterobacteriaceae. These factors can develop in any of the organisms in the class. The most important resistance factors at this time are the Klebsiella pneumonia beta-lactamase, or KPB, which is the most common form and has been spreading in the U.S. over the last seven to eight years the New Delhi metallo-beta-lactamase, or NDM1 for short, which was originally described in the Indian subcontinent, but is now well established in parts of Europe and the Far East, and is the subject of the recent reports in JAMA. This is still an uncommon mechanism, but now spreading in the U.S. The OXA48 is one of the oxacillinase beta-lactamase mechanisms, which is least common in the United States, but endemic in the Mediterranean basin, the Middle East, and now starting to show up in our country. What do we know about the frequency of CRE organisms in ERCP? Well, currently this appears to be limited in scope, but as these organisms become more common in North America, they will be a growing concern in our practices as they are for all fields of medicine. Clearly, ERCP, which is performed more than 500,000 times per year in the United States, is a critically important modality for treatment of disease, and it is life-saving in many instances. In the past two years, at least six clusters of infection have been presented in the medical and lay press, involving, according to the FDA, fewer than 150 patients at this point in time. In some cases, transmission has caused significant disease, potentially contributing to death in a number of patients with cancer or other comorbidities. In other cases, the CRE have only been identified by screening cultures from anal swabs, representing a chronic carrier state. The association of ERCP to CRE infections is not always obvious, as presentations are often delayed for weeks to months, and many do not occur in the biliary tree. Why is this happening? Duodenoscopes used for ERCP are complex instruments with components and functions not present in common straight endoscopes used in colonoscopy and EGD. We believe the elevator and the elevator cable of the side viewing duodenoscope is the region of greatest risk for persistent infection, even after usual cleaning. While standard reprocessing is generally adequate, in uncommon circumstances, organisms survive that process. In most patients, and for most bacteria, this remains a silent and harmless scenario. But for these rare organisms, the subsequent patient risk is likely much greater. CRE organisms themselves do not appear more difficult to eradicate than other bacteria, but once established on an endoscope, any bacteria may become more difficult to eradicate with usual practices. What should we do locally? 
On February 19th, the Food and Drug Administration highlighted the problem related to CRE transmission via duodenoscopes in a safety communication. Their statement, which provides guidance for endoscopy units across the country, can be reviewed at FDA.gov and more specifically at the site depicted on the screen. All aspects of the FDA warning, developed with the input of the ASGE, should be adopted by hospital endoscopy units. First and foremost, all units in which duodenoscopes and other instruments with elevators are used should reassess your reprocessing practices to ensure if they are being done consistently in accord with manufacturer's instructions for use. This should include review of your training programs and materials, re-education of your frontline staff about the issues specific to duodenoscopes and elevator cleaning, and performance and documentation of competency assessments now and at regular intervals. The FDA advises implementation of a comprehensive quality control program for reprocessing duodenoscopes with written procedures for monitoring training and adherence to the program and documentation of equipment tests, processes, and quality monitors used during the reprocessing procedure. All steps in reprocessing remain important, including bedside pre-washing and fluid aspiration until clear, manual washing and brushing with large volumes of water, followed by a usual high-level disinfection and drying. Concerted efforts should be employed to meticulously clean the elevator mechanism and the recesses surrounding the elevator mechanism by hand, even when using an automated endoscope reprocessor. The elevator should be raised and lowered throughout the manual cleaning process to allow brushing of both sides. Second, units should document or continue to document the individual endoscope used for each procedure to facilitate subsequent testing in the event that a patient is found to have a CRE infection following ERCP. If you suspect that problems with reprocessing a duodenoscope have led to patient infections or to positive results of bacterial surveillance culturing of duodenoscopes, you are encouraged to file voluntary reports to both the manufacturer and the FDA through their MedWatch Safety and Adverse Re Event Reporting Program. Third, collaboration with your local hospital epidemiology or infectious disease staff, quality officers, and administrators should be undertaken to better understand your local risks and to plan your response in the event of several potential clinical scenarios. This should include assessment of the prevalence of CRE in your institution and in your usual patient population, as this may help guide your local practices. The following suggestions pertain to several clinical scenarios that may present in your unit. At this time, in the absence of known CRE exposure or risk, the ASGE suggests that units consider one-time post-reprocessing culture surveillance of their entire inventory of elevator-equipped endoscopes. Alternatively, some centers might opt to proceed with one-time ethylene oxide sterilization of their entire inventory of instruments. This approach is not widely available and itself raises questions about instrument durability and expense, however. If cultures are employed, those instruments found to be positive for CRE should either undergo gas sterilization according to manufacturer's guidelines or repeat manual cleaning and high-level disinfection with sequestration of instruments until repeat cultures confirm absence of contamination. For routine daily practice, without known heightened CRE risks, no additional practices beyond diligent standard reprocessing of duodenoscopes is advised by the FDA at this time. Some centers, however, are employing double cycles of washing and reprocessing, and some are employing culture sequestration and or ethylene oxide sterilization after each procedure. These options should be reviewed with your hospital administrative and infection control staff to identify which approach is most practical and efficacious for your institution. The FDA and the ASGE advise when ERCP is performed in a patient with known CRE or other multidrug resistant organisms, or if a patient develops an infection with a multidrug resistant organism following ERCP and you suspect there may be a link between the duodenoscope and the infection, the duodenoscope should be taken out of service until it has been verified to be free of pathogens before reuse. This would entail either endoscope culture and sequestration following high-level disinfection or ethylene oxide sterilization. 
Similar steps should be taken with the duodenoscope when a patient is identified with a CRE infection within several months after an ERCP. In this setting, your institution should also consider notification of intervening patients to enable screening or close observation for potential resistant infections. What about testing endoscopes for ATP or other bioburdens during or immediately after reprocessing? While widely practiced, for this particular issue, we currently don't have sufficient data to rely upon routine use of surveillance testing of endoscopes for blood, ATP, or other bioburdens, but these approaches clearly warrant additional research. What is being done nationally? This issue is receiving significant attention from the CDC, the FDA, the manufacturers, and the ASGE, all of whom have collaborated in one fashion or another to address steps to enhance the safety of ERCP, both for today and for the future. The ASGE is convening a summit meeting of all these parties in late March of this year, including staff from many of the affected sites, to establish national priorities and directions for further work. The ASGE, with industry assistance, will soon announce funding and a request for proposals for research to further understand several elements of the problem. Finally, the ASGE will be presenting a 90-minute session on infection control in endoscopy at DDW on Monday morning, May 18th. This session will involve representatives of the CDC, the FDA, and several centers currently wrestling with this issue. I hope you can attend.